installing these, we keep the little red pin on the side with the power connector. And that also lines up, in this case, there happens to be a slot there too, and that makes it real easy. You don't have to remember which way it goes on. Now, I've got a kind of a special problem here. You might have this problem too. Most CD uh, ROM drives have a third connector besides the power cable and the IDE connector. Mm -hmm. They have an audio connector. Oh boy. This is gonna go from the audio connector on the CD mm -hmm. to the sound card, and it's so we can listen to audio CDs. The audio that's played back from the auto CD just gets set right to the sound card without the computer intervening in the middle. So that is gonna go on the far edge. I usually put that in first on the CD because it's so far away from me, I wanna put it in before I put in the other cables. You're not gonna really be able to see me do this because it's so <laughs> deeply buried within that computer there. And I'm gonna slide this yeah. right in there and connect it then, now that I've got it connected there, and you can see this, I'm gonna connect it to the sound card there's mm -hmm. a logical place to put it. The sound card is labeled so that you can, it'll say CD audio in, and there it is right there. Hmm. I'm gonna stick it right in there. And this little wire is just gonna sit there in the middle of your case, getting in your way, but you need it if you wanna listen right. to audio CDs on the, uh, on the system. Now, we have a variety of different cables here. Darcy went out and she went crazy. She bought us rounded cables. She bought us flat ribbon cables. We've got UDMA 33, UDMA 66, UDA 1, MA 100 cables. Could also be ATA 33, ATA 66, <laughs> ATA 100. <laughs> what do I use, you might ask? Well, the rounded cables are a finesse just to make it look pretty inside and to keep airflow. I don't actually like to use rounded cables. I'm of the opinion ribbon cables are ribbon cables for a reason. They give you better separation and shielding of the signals. So I use ribbon cables. If you want to use rounded cables, you go right ahead. If you have an ATA66 drive, you have to use these special ATA66 cables. And if you look closely, this, this, the dark gray one is an ATA66 cable. It has twice as many wires in it as the ATA33 cable. Since we have ATA66 drives, that's the cable I'm gonna use to attach it. You'll notice the cables are color-coded, and that's for a reason. The blue end of the cable here, that's gonna go to the motherboard, and these other two are for attaching to the drives. So these cables have gotten a little bit fancier than the old IDE cables. Mm -hmm. We now have to attach the blue directly to the motherboard. It is keyed, just as Patrick said, so you can't put it in wrong and then one of these is gonna to go to my hard drive. I don't have two drives on this IDE chain. As I mentioned, every motherboard these days has two IDE uh, connectors, each of which can handle two devices for a total of four IDE devices, hard drives, CDs, zip drives. In my case, I only have two IDE devices, a hard drive and a CD-ROM. And in order to make my machine more efficient, I'm gonna put the hard drive on this cable and I'm gonna put the CD-ROM, which is a, a ATA33 device, on this cable and they won't share IDE chains. That gives me better performance. I'm putting it right in and that's gonna go to my hard drive. And then, isn't it nice when, when you do this before you've put in a lot of stuff, makes it very easy to add these cables. Uh, where's the challenge in not there's, having all the stuff no in challenge. there? This is the old style uh, ATA33 or UDMA33 uh, cable, and it doesn't uh, matter which end you put uh, in which uh, side. So uh, I usually put the one that has the longest length. Uh, this one will go on the motherboard, and then these two closer to the other ones will go to the uh, drives themselves. This is gonna go to my CD-ROM, which is the slower uh, ATA33 specification. Put that right in there. If you don't have keyed cables, as Patrick mentioned, the red line on the cable is the number one wire that should go to the number one pin of the connector. Now, this is one of those areas where you get fancy when you're rounding the cables from one end of the system to the other. Remember, no sharp bends, no sharp breaks, don't time in the knots, just be gentle. You I'm can't fold them over flat to change directions, but try to do it once. The floppy cables look very different than the IDE cables. The connectors are smaller, as Patrick observed, and uh, there really is only, uh, you know, they can't fit into the other cables. Um, one thing to note with floppy cables, and Patrick got burned on this on that Build Your Own PC Challenge, mm -hmm. normally on the floppy cable, the red wire goes closest to the power supply, and that's true on all drives. The red wire, the number one wire, is closest to the power supply, but not always. Patrick found a floppy drive that was the other way around, and that's what kept you from winning that race, isn't it? It made me a little bitter. They little tricked bitter you today. They tricked you, Patrick. For once, I'm finally beating you. I'm actually ready to put my uh, power cables on. Oh so while Patrick fiddles with his drives, moving it around so that he can get his stuff hooked up, we're going to show you how to hook up 
this stuff. These are all the power cables that come out of the power supply. And uh, most of them, there's really three different kinds. Uh, most of them look like this. These are the ones that are going to hook up to the hard drive and the CDs. There should be one that looks like that. That's the power supply cable that goes to the motherboard. And then there'll be one or two that look like this. These are for the floppy drives. Sometimes other devices use these kinds of power connectors, but typically hard drive, CD-ROM, floppy drive, and this is for the power supply. And then, by the way, my fans also uh, use them. In fact, just in case, I bought a couple of extra of these uh, connectors, these extra uh, uh, splitter connectors that Patrick was talking about so that I can make sure that all my fans are connected. So I'm going to put my motherboard, I'm going to wire it up. Now remember, this shouldn't be plugged in while you're doing this. I hope it hasn't been plugged in all along. This especially is a time as we start to connect the power up to these devices, you want to make sure that nothing is connected, that you have discharged any static electricity. You've been doing that all along, I'm sure. And we're going to put this uh, power supply cable in. Only one way to do it, only one way it'll fit. It's actually, you can't probably see it, but the, uh, the uh, connectors are shaped in such a way that they can only fit in in one way. And this is a little clip that's going to snap right in there. I'm going to put it right in here. Uh, all right, I'm going to connect up here to my uh, hard drive. Um, I, you know, Patrick, you could tell me. I, maybe it's superstitious of me, but I don't like to have, when I have a situation like this with one cable and it's got three devices that I could connect up to it, I kind of, I don't like to put all my devices on one wire. Well, you know it's what I'm like saying? putting all of your eggs in one basket. Absolutely right. Distribute it around. It may not make a difference, but you know what? Be a little superstitious. Why take a chance? Spread well, it around. I'll tell you where you especially don't want to do that is with fans, because if, for instance, something, one of them dies, you don't want all of the fans to go out all at once. That would be bad. I like to keep some cooling going. So I'm going to put that one in my hard drive. It's rounded also on the uh, corners here, so again, uh, there's only one way to put this in. Most of the stuff, there's only one way to connect these things. There's only a few things like the floppy drive that will give you some leeway for error. And now you see, I really have a mess of spaghetti in here. And I'm going to really try to tidy this up, get this stuff out of the way, so that there's a free flow of air through here and out of the case, and that this doesn't get in the way. What you really want to make sure is that there are no wires anywhere near fan blades, because what's going to happen? Well, the fan blade will eventually strip off the insulation, cause a short circuit. You could even have a fire in there. So be very careful about that. Make sure all these wires are well away from the fan blades, well away from anywhere they can get into trouble. You take a look inside this case. Now, this is actually not too bad. We're still cleaning up the layout of the cables. But deep inside the Pentium 4 system we're building is an ATX connector. And just next to the ATX connector and half hidden by this cable here is oh, an additional that. power connector. So it would probably behoove you to install, in this case, this particular machine. We normally don't do this to install the power connectors first. But you know what? I'm just not smart enough to do that. So You're I'm going to put that in place. You're and I've got my ATX madman. connector. And just slide it right down in there until you get a nice firm connection. Well, I'm feeling pretty good. I've, I've checked all my cables. I got everything in here. I've actually used some twist ties, as we mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. some of those special plastic ties. Not, of course, the ones you get for garbage bags, but these electrical safe <laughs> Although uh, ties. Although I've seen the garbage Not bag. Not a good thing. idea, I don't think, yeah. to uh, get some of the cables out of the way so we got good free airflow. Mm -hmm. In fact, I feel so confident. I even put one of the panels, not both. Dude, you put both the panels on, I guarantee you, you're going to jinx yourself. You'll have to take <laughs> something apart to you're make right. it boot. So I just feel half confident. So I put one of the panels on. <laughs> when I put it back, though, and I didn't replace it with the regular screws, I used these great thumb screws. It makes it very easy when I want to open the case at another time just to very unscrew nice. it. So I'm going to do that with the other side. You ready for the moment of truth? Let's do it. All right, now that we got all the parts together, it's almost time to plug these babies in and start them up. Follow along with us, techtv.com slash build a PC. Coming up next, we're going to show you how to plug in, boot up, configure your BIOS, and troubleshoot if things don't go exactly as planned. But first, let's recap. We've now installed the various cards we need inside the PC. We've, we've connected them all up. We've installed a modem, and we attached the cables to that, and we've attached all the power cables inside. One cable we haven't attached yet, because it's the last thing you do is the cable on the outside, the power supply to the plug. We'll do that, and then we're going to start it up. All right, now it's time to fire this puppy up and see if it actually works. Nope, this kidding. is the moment of truth. I'm so excited. We, we've got it all set up here. We've got our, our mouse mm -hmm. and our keyboard, our power supply, our network interface. Shall we start it? Uh, that's oh, the keyboard sure. that's going to go right into the 
keyboard uh, connection now, there. Usually these are actually color coded, green for the mouse, purple for the keyboard. Well, that's pictures on them. One of the disadvantages of making your own PC is sometimes you don't have that. Yeah. That you know, this is something that if you bought a PC, you'd have a road map, you'd have. But you, look at you know better because you we built it. In the you video. know how it all goes. Should we plug in an Ethernet or modem just? For I'll fun? tell you why we're going to need Ethernet on okay. this one. You need a net connection to install our operating system. We're going to install oh, Windows boy. XP today, and so when we install it, it's going to go out on the internet and uh, and say, here ah. I am. I'm All really right. nervous. Hold on. Ladies and gentlemen, just take a deep breath. Relax. If it doesn't start up immediately, it's you know not what the we're going to do? We're going to do a little troubleshooting. A troubleshooter. And we'll fix it. Okay? Now, All by right. the way, I'm leaving it open, and it's very important that you do the same, because I want to look. The first thing I want to look at when I press the power button is to see if these fans are operating. If they're not, I'm going to turn it off right away. I'm not going to fry my processor. So look, this is the most important fan, but look at all the other fans. Make sure the fans are operating. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, let's let's press this power button. In three, two, one. All right, the fan's on. That's great. That fan's on. That fan's on. All I'm right. feeling good. This is a good sign. Look, we got a boot up message on the screen. We got That's the a card, very good strike. Now we're going to go into the BIOS. So we should tell the folks at home what the BIOS is, what this, what this is mess this? Okay, that I'm looking at. <laughs> I want to call it, thanks to a novel I once read, the built-in operating system. Uh-uh, it's the basic input-output <laughs> system. It lives in the chipset inside the motherboard. It, it controls all the basic functions of the PC. When you hit that power switch, power goes into the motherboard. And the chipset wakes up and it looks around and goes, okay, I got a graphics card, I, I got a hard drive, I'm, I'm a computer, I've got a chip, I've got memory. It goes through its own little checklist. It goes through the checklist, it sees everything at once, it's going to go to your hard drive and look for the operating system. If you don't have an operating system installed, which we don't yet, we haven't installed our operating system, it's just going to get a little upset because it's going to go, I haven't found an operating system, what's going on? But before you even get to that stage, you're going to change any settings you need to change in your BIOS. For instance, I've disabled the onboard sound card because we put our own sound sure. card in. And you might want to do things like that. This, as I said, you want to look at the hardware monitor. That's going to tell you if you'd set up everything and if the speed is correct, the CPU fan is running. And then I do need, in fact, to mm -hmm. change on this machine. And I'm trying to find where to do that. The RAM speed and the, and the, and the bus speed on this. Now, thing. if we hadn't been able to get into the BIOS, folks, probably what would have happened is we either wouldn't have seen that the first thing that shows up on the screen there is a little sort of a little mini message from your graphics card. Then you get stuff from your motherboard. Here's what happens, though. If that doesn't work, remember how we told you how it was important to connect your speaker? Here's why. The power on self-test. It's called a post-test. If something's missing, the memory, the, the chip, any, you know, the graphics board, what's going to happen is it's going to start beeping at you. It's going to sound like Morse code. Well, those codes, you write that down. It could be too short, too long, one, all these different codes. You go in your motherboard manual, it'll give you a list of those post codes, those power on self-test codes, and it'll say, oh, your graphics card isn't working or your memory isn't working. Shut the machine down. Make sure the part it's looking for is properly installed and away you go. This system, to get into the BIOS mm -hmm. setup, I press the delete key. It'll vary. You'll have to read the message when you first see the computer booting up. This is a screen. Look, we don't have an operating system installed on here, but we can get software to run. This is software that's built into the operating system. Uh, built into the hardware, I should say, that allows us to change some settings. One setting you're, of course, going to want to change right away is the date and time. It probably won't be set correctly, so let's get that set all right. We're going to be New Year's Day 2002, the f back to the future. Now I want to set the time as well. Uh, normally it'll automatically detect all the different drives. You won't have to do anything. You do want to make sure that it sees the floppy drive. That's a very good sign. And it sees all the memory too. You can see over there on the on the right hand side of the screen. We've got all the 256 megs of RAM we installed. We can look at some other features here. These are advanced features like what boots first. I'm going to change the first boot device right here to CD-ROM because we're going to install our operating system from CD-ROM. I'll also take a look at some of the other things. You can browse around. Be careful. Don't modify things willy-nilly. There's yeah, important. If you don't know what you're changing, <laughs> yeah. don't change it. <laughs> if you do change